We saw in the last video that the skeptical solution accepts the claim that there are no facts about meaning, and it tries to show that we don't need any meaning facts in order to justify our statements about meaning. We've seen that there are uh, various problems with this proposal. The other kind of approach is the straight solution, and the straight solution tries to refute the skeptic's argument directly. <coughs> There are various ways we might do this. Uh, in this video, I'll outline the response that I find the most plausible. Um, there's, there's a huge uh, literature about Kripkenstein's sceptical argument. M many philosophers have defended more sophisticated versions of the responses that we looked at in the first video. Uh, for instance, appealing to mental content or appealing to a more sophisticated version of dispositionalism or trying to argue that uh, meanings are just brute facts. For various reasons, I I'm inclined to agree with Kripkenstein that none of these approaches are especially satisfying, um, but I, I'll just note at this point that Kripkenstein doesn't have the last word on any of these. They are live options. The response that I find the most plausible has been suggested by the philosopher Craig Delancey in his article Meaning Naturalism, Meaning Irrealism and the Work of Language, and it appeals to simplicity. I think it's a fairly uh, intuitive idea. You may have thought of it yourself when watching the first video. The thought is this. Plus is simpler than cus. Indeed, plus is simpler than any uh, deviant function like cus. Uh, plus is the simplest function that is compatible with my behavior and my dispositions uh, You know, with respect to the word plus. It's, it's um, it's the function that is the most compatible with my, that is the simplest function that is compatible with my use of the word plus, or at least it's broadly compatible. I mean, obviously, um, my my use of the word plus doesn't exactly match the plus function because I sometimes make mistakes, but it's generally in line with the plus function. Uh, of course, Kripkenstein's sceptical arguments show that my behaviour and dispositions alone don't determine my meaning exactly. So, but this is where simplicity comes in. The, the thought is that where there are various meanings possible, the simplest of the uh, available options is automatically as assigned. Meaning is partially determined by simplicity. You look at, at behaviour, at dispositions and so on to generate various possible meanings and then you use simplicity to narrow it down to one meaning. Basically, I know that myself and others mean plus not cuss because plus is simpler than cuss and individuals should and generally do use simpler rules to produce and recognize meaningful utterances. <coughs> now the basic worry about an appeal to simplicity is that simplicity is not well defined. Plus certainly seems uh, simpler than cuss to us but aren't judgments of simplicity largely subjective? I mean, um, <clears throat> there, there do seem to be a few uh, uh, sort of obvious cases. Um, you, know, you, can, you can imagine a very uh, a minimalist painting, for instance. Um, you know, a, a, if, if you imagine just a, a painting that's nothing but a white square, that's, that's presumably simpler in terms of the placement of colours than a Jackson Pollock painting. But then if you if you go into a, a you know a, an art gallery and look at a landscape painting and a portrait painting um which one is simpler uh there just doesn't really seem to be any any fact of the matter it looks looks like that judgment is going to be mo ma mainly subjective so similarly i mean ca can we say that plus is objectively simpler than 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 cuss however delancey suggests that this has actually been solved um a, a standard, objective and non-arbitrary measure of simplicity is provided by Kolmogorov complexity. Kolmogorov complexity, uh, to quote Delancey, he says uh, it, it defines the amount of information in a string of symbols as being the size of the minimal length computer program that would be able to produce that string. Uh, a more intuitive way to phrase it is to ask how much compression of the string is possible. Less compressible strings are more complex. So consider this string, uh, A, B, A, B, A, B, and, and so on, repeated over and over. This has a very short description. It's a long string, but it's got a short description. A, B times 17. 
that's only seven characters, including the uh, spaces. And obviously, I mean, we could we could extend uh, this A B A B. We could we could just keep that on, you know, thousands of times, and we'd still have a, a very short description. So it's very compressible, in other words. On the other hand, think about this uh, string. Well, this is not compressible. The shortest description of this uh, is just to write down the string itself. Uh, now, note that. Uh, as well, that a, a, a procedure sufficient to recognize a string would have a complexity close to that required to produce it. Um, but so, so the, the, but the important point here is is comp compressibility. Um, basically, we can compress this very long string. Whereas, I mean, this is a relatively short string, but we can't get it any any shorter. Uh, now, we can also ask about the cohomology of complexity of procedures like plus and cus. First of all, note that we can represent the outputs of plus and cus as strings of symbols, though in this case, uh, you know, we need strings of triplets of numbers. So plus would be something like this. So what, what you can see, we have you know, 1, 1, 2, and, and that, of course, is 1 plus 1 is 2, and then you have 1, 2, 3, 1 plus 2 is 3, and, and so on, and, and that goes on indefinitely. Cus, on the other hand, would look like this. Um, again, it's the same as plus to begin with, but then once you get into... Um, numbers higher than 57, it always returns 5. Uh, now, a string of the cus function long enough to pass the 57 threshold is more complex in terms of Kolmogorov complexity than the plus function. We can see that plus is simpler than cus by considering what a computer program would need in order to execute, uh, you know, these, these sort of produce these, these strings. Uh, so imagine a Turing machine. Turing machines are not uh, actual machines. It's, it's an abstract mathematical idea. But uh, real machines can behave relevantly like Turing machines. Um, now a Turing machine has four components. First, it has an infinitely long tape divided into cells. Second, it has a finite alphabet of symbols that are written in the cells, one symbol per cell. We'll use the symbols 0 and 1. So the alphabet for our Turing machine is simply 0 and 1. Third, it has a scanner printer or a head that reads one cell at a time. It can erase what is in the cell, it can write something new in the cell, and it can move the tape left or right. Finally, it has a set of instructions which tell the head what to do when it reads the symbol in the cell. Basically, this is the program. This tells the machine how to transform a certain set of symbols into another set. So we're just imagining, basically, a Turing machine is, is just, you know, it's, it's a long tape, and then you've got um, something that can, you know, the symbols on the tape, and then you have something that can transform those, those symbols, change the symbols, and, uh, you know, m move the tape along, and it, has a, and it can have a program that tells it how to transform the symbols. So it's a it's it's a very simple um, machine. Now it's an important concept because despite its simplicity it can uh, simulate any computer algorithm. In particular it can execute any uh, operation or function like plus uh, or cus or any other deviant function. So um, I'm going to simplify this a little bit to make the point easier to understand but suppose we have a tape on which we uh, represent two numbers as strings of ones separated by a single zero with zeros on each side. So four and five would be like this. So we've got a zeros going off into infinity there. And then we have four ones here and five ones here with a zero in between. So that's the that's what the tape shows at the moment. And that, that represents the number four and that represents the number five. Now notice that all the machine needs to do to add these numbers is write uh, 1 over the center 0 and replace uh, a 1 at the end. You can replace a 1 at either end. Let's say it replaces this 1 at this end with a 0, which will give us this. So it's written a 1 over that 0 and it's replaced this 1 with a 0. And if you count those 1s, you'll see there are 9 1s there. So we have 4 and 5 and then we have 9. Um, and that you know, that's, that's 4 plus 5. Um, now, obviously, this procedure can be generalized to any addition whatsoever. So to perform addition, the machine simply replaces the zero in between uh, two sets of ones, and then it 
replaces uh, a one at the end with a zero. That executes the plus function. It adds two numbers together. So the instructions in this case are very simple, right? The the uh, the sort of the, the head starts say at the left. Um, let's say it you know it starts at the left. It moves right. Okay, so it's then it sees a one. You replace that one with a zero, and then you move right until you um, reach uh, the next zero. Then you replace that zero with a one, and that's it. That's addition, and that can be applied to any. That can do any addition whatsoever. The machine doesn't need to be given any further instructions beyond this. So that's very simple. What about cuss? Well, for cuss, the program must record whether either string is over 57, and if so, it must erase all but five ones on the tape. Essentially, then, the program requires additional information for interpreting the numbers. It needs to know, uh, you know whether it has seen more than 57 ones. Um, you know, whereas, whereas executing plus, it can just sort of be blind, so to speak. It, it doesn't need to kind of keep track of the amount of ones it's seen. In order to execute plus, it needs to know that it's seen 57 ones. So that needs to be, it needs additional instructions for that. It also needs additional information to encode the, the different uh, operation of erasing all but one fives. So it needs to be able to do what plus does. You know, it needs to, bo to, to replace the center zero with a one, and it needs to replace a one at the end with a zero. It needs to do that for all numbers under 57, and then it needs to do something very different for numbers over 57. So we can see that a program which executes the cus function must be larger than a program that executes plus. Um, it, 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 it must, uh, you know, the, the, at least the, the minimal length program must, uh, must be bigger. Now recall that the Kolmogorov of complexity of a particular operational function uh, can be defined in terms of the minimal length computer program that is required to execute it. Plus requires a shorter program, so plus is simpler than cus. Cus has greater Kolmogorov complexity. Um, so this shows us that we can define simplicity in a in an objective way. This gives us a a, a non-arbitrary and objective definition of simplicity. Now the question then is, well, okay, but why does simplicity matter? You know, why why should we why does it matter that plus is simpler than cus? Well, we assume that events we observe are caused by various things. In particular, when we interpret an agent making utterances, we assume that those utterances are caused by some procedures in the, in the agent. Um, when somebody is asked, what is 68 plus 57? We assume that their answer is a result of something going on inside them, presumably something going on inside their heads. The, the meaningful utterances of other people are caused by certain things going on inside them. So when so an interpretation of a person's meaning involves imputing some sort of internal procedure to them. In other words, if I think that Frank means plus, there must be some, some procedure going on in Frank which causes his utterances. And this procedure is different to the procedure that, that would have to be going on if Frank meant cuss. Now basically, Delancey's argument is that the interpretations of meaning that assign the simplest procedures are likely to be correct because humans tend to use simpler procedures to produce and recognize meaningful utterances. And uh, the same is true for interpreting our own meanings. My own utterances are caused by procedures going on inside me, and I should adopt the interpretation of my own meaning that assigns the simplest procedures. Simplicity is important due to a basic biological fact. For biological processes, Increased complexity imposes increased cost in time and resources. Now, if we're naturalists, if we believe that humans evolved just like any other animals, and that human minds, and hence meanings, are fundamentally based on biological processes, then it follows that the procedures that we use for producing and recognizing meaningful utterances are subject to complexity costs. Producing and recognizing meanings takes time and energy. Um, you know, we might not notice it because it's automatic, but it, it does. It takes time and energy. So it is subject to these uh, complexity costs. It costs time and resources. There is significant selective pressure for reducing costs of time and resources.
When a particular task requires less time and fewer resources, this means uh, first that there is a higher probability of accomplishing the task, and second uh, that, that, that there will be more time and resources available for other tasks. So the evolution and development of a system uh, of, for, for, of meaning procedures will tend towards minimal resource use. Uh, our capacities for producing meanings are products of evolution, and as such they will have been under uh, constant and powerful pressure to reduce complexity costs. Of course, all of this is with the caveat other things being equal. There are certainly contexts where uh, more complex procedures may be preferred for various reasons. Um, indeed, the option that would require the fewest uh, resources would be to simply have no system of meaning production at all. But given that there is uh, selective pressure for a system of meaning production, there will also be powerful pressure to keep that system as simple as possible. So when we learn meanings and you know, when we recognize meanings in others, um, we will tend to adopt the simplest interpretation that fits the facts. And this follows as a matter of uh, the biological constraints on the human learning system. Here's the argument a bit more formally. Uh, more complex procedures make higher demands on time and resource use. The evolution of a system for making and recognizing meaningful utterances uh, will encourage minimal time and resource use. Plus is less complex than cus and other deviant functions. So uh, it is likely that when we make statements about addition, people use plus, not cus. Let me add uh, two clarifications here. First, Delancey is not saying that we evolved to understand the meaning of the word plus. Presumably, mathematics is not a product of evolution, or at least it requires a, a significant cultural background before we can develop mathematics. Um, and anyway, clearly there are meanings that, that cannot have been favoured by evolution. Think of the word uh, computer, or supernova, or uh, general relativity. Obviously, that's not that those have not evolved. Uh, Delancey's point, rather, is that our general system, uh, our general capacity for making and recognizing meanings, will have evolved to use simpler procedures. When uh, when when the learning system is confronted with some new rule, but there are many possible interpretations, it will tend to adopt the simplest interpretation. Second, uh, this is of course something that goes on. Uh, unconsciously. We're not aware that this is how our learning systems work. This is the case though for many aspects of our minds. There are all sorts of processes involved in perception, in balance, in memory, in sensation and so on that we're just not aware of. So it shouldn't be surprising that the same is true for making and recognizing meanings. Indeed, for an example that's more closely related, consider grammar. Many people produce grammatical sentences without having any formal understanding of grammar. Um, so, so the, the point is, is that a lot of what you know, a lot of our mental processes are are not conscious. So that the you know the the fact that we choose the simplest interpretation that isn't conscious, but that's no reason to to assume that that's not how it works. Uh, so that, I think that's um, the, the main argument, although there's, there's maybe a, a second argument for the importance of simplicity, which is that, in general, we treat simplicity as a norm uh, when constructing theories. This is certainly the case in the sciences. Scientists tend to prefer simpler theories. You're all familiar with uh, Occam's razor, do not multiply entities beyond necessity. Now, arguably, constructing interpretations of the meanings of yourself and others is an application of theory. It's a kind of theory. As such, it's subject to the standard norms of theory construction. Don't multiply entities beyond necessity, but CUS does just this, because as we saw, it requires an extra step for recognizing numbers. It requires extra information for carrying out tasks and so on. Um, I mean, of course, you know, this is not such a, a powerful argument, and one obvious objection is that there are significant differences between scientific theories and assignments of meaning to other people. Um, uh, but there's, there's maybe a more indirect point here, um, which is that the methods of science 
generally that they're, they're sort of an extension of the everyday methods we have for getting about in the world broadly speaking scientists uh, apply the same techniques as as you do in in everyday life so one uh, obvious method for learning about the world is straightforward perception you open your eyes and look around scientists use the same method they make observations only of course they augment their observations with equipment like telescopes and microscopes and so on um, uh, if you think about everyday behaviour, we you know there are many contexts where we might have to generate theories and look for evidence. Suppose you're a hunter-gatherer and you're out looking for a deer to kill. Well, you'll have some sort of theory as to where deer might be and what they do. Um, you'll look for evidence of deer activity, for instance, hoof prints. You generate a hypothesis about where the deer are and uh, you see if you can find more supporting evidence and so on. Um, so the fact that simplicity is and always has been a basic assumption in all of science might suggest that it's also employed in, in everyday life. So these are the, are the two arguments for the simplicity solution. There's the biological argument and the argument that simplicity is a general norm for choosing theories. Um, basically then this straight solution to the paradox, to the sceptical paradox, uh, looks at prior behaviour and dispositions uh, to, 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 to kind of generate various meanings and then combines that with the injunction to choose the simplest procedure that is broadly compatible with the observed behaviour and dispositions. To give uh, a final example from Delancey of the, the importance of simplicity, consider the following two strings of uh, possible coin flips. Um, you know, let, let's say that uh, heads is one, tails is zero. Um, now one of these strings I made up, the other was generated by flipping a coin. So the question is which one did I make up and which one was generated randomly? The answer is obvious. Um, the, the second one is clearly the random one. Obviously I made up A. That's, that's not something that I that, that, that I just made by flipping a coin. Um, but, but why are we so sure about that? I mean, that is clearly the right answer, but, but why? Um, I mean, basic probability theory will tell you that each string is equally likely. If you throw a coin, each time you throw it, there's a 50-50 chance of getting heads. So any particular string of a given length is just as likely as any other string of that length. Some people find this claim somewhat surprising. Uh, I mean, intuitively, we would think that um, uh, that string A is less likely than string B. Um, this is the source of the idea uh, that if you've, uh, let's say you've flipped a coin, you, you have a run of six heads. Uh, many people intuitively think that, well, because I've flipped six heads, I'm more likely to land a tail next time. That's, that's, that's a fallacy. Each coin flip is independent of the flips before it. Each coin flip has a 50-50 chance of landing heads. So any particular string of heads and tails is just as likely as any other string of the same length. So A is just as likely to, be, to have been generated by flipping coins as B. So, and, and yet we know um, that it's clearly B that was generated by flipping coins, even though each of these strings was just as likely to have been produced by flipping coins. We know that it's B, and A is the one that I made up. Now, Delancey says that the reason why we immediately recognize the first string as the one I made up is because it has lower Kolmogorov complexity. The minimal size program needed to generate string one is smaller than the minimal size program needed to generate string two. And, and what, you know, what this example shows is that simplicity is the, the mark of of the mind. We immediately recognize which string is simpler and we recognize that the simpler string is by far the most likely to have been produced by a creature with a mind. Our minds are built to fix on simplicity and when we when we see simplicity we we, we recognize it as something that is designed as it were or something that is produced by a mind. Um, so this example, I think, is a, is a great illustration of how of how we we immediately recognise simplicity as a product of minds, and so that you know this 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 example I think supports the the idea that um, that when we interpret meanings, we will tend to assign the simplest meaning. Okay, let's consider some objections. Well, an obvious challenge is to say 
Okay, sure, plus maybe simpler than cuss uh, in computer science or whatever, but for human brains, surely uh, answering five automatically is, sim is simpler than working out the sum. If, if uh, you ask me uh, what's 5,833 plus 7,745, it's far simpler. It requires less time and resources to automatically respond five than to bother doing the sum. Uh, indeed, for some numbers, it's it's just impossible for us to do the sum because the numbers are bigger than what we can comprehend. So, surely then, cus is actually simpler than plus. Um, I think that this objection rests on a slight misunderstanding. Uh, it is indeed easier to respond five than to do the sum, but the point is that as rules, plus is simpler than cus. The rule is simpler, and the rule is what matters. Um, I mean, it's what is it that we learn when we learn to do basic arithmetic? Is it the plus rule or the cus rule? Here, the simplicity of plus over any uh, deviant rules becomes important. So, you know, let's say Frank has added before uh, six, three plus six, uh, sixteen plus twenty-three, and so on, and he's now confronted with some novel problem, sixty-eight plus fifty-seven. It's it's the rule. Um, you know, we, we assume that other people are, are and ourselves are acting by applying certain procedures. The simplest procedure, the simplest rule, is the most likely. And as we have argued above, cus is not the simplest, plus is the simplest. Uh, now, uh, Kripkenstein does consider the appeal to simplicity. He has several objections to it. One of his objections is that simplicity is not well defined. Uh, however, we've already seen that, uh, that and, and you know, that, that point is fairly easily dealt with these days. Simplicity is perfectly well defined. But another criticism he has is that simplicity is just irrelevant. Uh, suppose we analyse plus and cus, and it turns out that cus is actually simpler. Well, we wouldn't decide that we meant cus all along. Uh, no, we'd say we meant plus, and we'd keep on saying that we mean plus. So this suggests that simplicity measures are just irrelevant. Now, on this point, I'm... I'm actually inclined to, to bite the bullet. I would say that if we behaved consistently with cus, and if it turned out that the cus rule was simpler, then we should accept that we were always using cus. Um, uh, this point has no force in the real world because obviously our actual behavior isn't consistent with cus, and also uh, because as demonstrated, cus is not simpler, neither are, are any other deviant functions. And indeed, it's not just that, you know, it's not just that cus is more complex in in the actual world, but you know possibly cus could be simpler. No, as a necessary mathematical fact, cus is more complex than plus. But sure, I mean, if you could find a deviant interpretation that is in line with our behaviour and that is simpler than plus, then that should be preferred over plus. A third objection is that simplicity is not normative. Uh, remember, uh, meaning is supposed to be normative. If you mean plus then you ought to answer the question, what is 68 plus 57 with 125? But simplicity doesn't supply any justification for, for one response rather than another. The, the mere fact that 125 is the answer given by the simpler rule doesn't entail that you ought to answer 125 rather than 5. Uh, now, Delancey uh, just denies this. He claims uh, that contrary to Kripkenstein, simplicity is normative. Now, one point that, that we need to keep in mind here is uh, the, the is-ought problem, most famously noted by David Hume, which is that we can't derive an ought from an is, or we can't derive a norm from merely descriptive facts. The way the world is doesn't tell us anything about, the, about what we ought to do, about what we should do. Now, this seems to present a problem for simplicity, because to say that plus is simpler than cus, that's just a descriptive fact. It doesn't in itself tell us anything about what we should do. At this point is correct, but it doesn't really uh, matter, because uh, we, can, we can simply add a norm. Uh, so here are two possibilities. First, we can adopt uh, the norm for any two interpretations of behaviour, we should prefer the interpretation that is more likely to be correct. And that does indeed seem to be a norm that we use because uh, we want to have accurate interpretations of ourselves and of others. Now, uh, per the biological argument that was given earlier, 
plus is more likely to be the true interpretation than cus. Biological systems, as a matter of fact, tend towards simpler procedures, simpler events are more likely. Given this fact and given this norm, we get the conclusion that we, we should, we ought to, prefer the simpler interpretation. Uh, another option is, is more direct, just have the norm for any two interpretations of behaviour, we should prefer the simpler interpretation. We already noted that this kind of norm is adopted in the sciences. Scientists assume that simpler theories are better. Uh, but in, in any event, it's, um, you know, it's, it, you know, it's obvious that it's easy enough for the simplicity response to capture the normative aspect of, of meaning. Finally, uh, Kripkenstein might object that the appeal to simplicity misses the point of the sceptical argument. What the sceptic is saying is that there is no fact of the matter about whether I mean plus or cuss. Uh, simplicity considerations may help us decide between competing hypotheses, but plus and cuss are not really competing hypotheses. So it's, it's therefore just nonsense to talk about one being more probable than another. By comparison, consider emotivism about morality. This is the view that moral statements have no truth value. I mentioned uh, error theory in uh, the last video. Emotivism is subtly different. The error theorist says that all moral statements are false. The emotivist says that, that all moral statements are neither true nor false. According to the emotivist, the claim killing is wrong is just like saying boo to killing. Now, obviously boo to killing can't be either true or false. It's, it's a, a brute exp expression of your feelings about killing. Again, I, I have a video on, on this if you're interested in the details. The point here is that if we are emotivists about morality, then um, take the claims, uh, killing is always wrong and killing is acceptable in self-defence. Well, the emotivists would say that they do not state competing hypotheses about killing because it's not even in principle possible for either one to be, to be true or false. Uh, they, they're just, you know, they're not the kinds of statements that can have truth value so they're not hypotheses at all, just as uh, if, if you, uh, say, hit your thumb with a hammer and scream, ouch, that's not a hypothesis. Um, now, Kripkenstein might say that the sceptical argument shows a similar point holds for plus and cuss. They, they, these are not two competing theories about my meaning. Uh, there cannot be any facts in the matter either way. There are two points to make here. First, um, this argument only works if the sceptic uh, can show that statements about meaning are neither true nor false. So the statement, Frank means plus, has no truth value at all. But it's not entirely obvious that the sceptical argument actually shows this. Uh, another option is to say that statements about meaning do have a truth value, it's just that they're all false. Recall the analogy to moral error theory. If statements about meaning are among the statements that have truth value, then they can be competing hypotheses. Uh, for instance, if we're atheists, then we will say that all statements about the properties of God are false. Nevertheless, there can still be competing hypotheses about the properties of God. Uh, one important debate about God concerns his knowledge of future events. So one hypothesis is that God has a perfect knowledge of everything that will happen in the future. This seems to be implied by his omniscience, but it poses problems for human free will, because he, you know, God, in this view, knows everything we are going to do in the future. On, on another hypothesis is that God does not know what will occur in the future, perhaps because facts about the future are indeterminate. That's better for free will, but it's kind of difficult to reconcile with his, with his om, omniscience. Uh, the point is that for the atheist, both of these hypotheses are false, but they're clearly competing hypotheses. Uh, in the same way, the sceptical argument is compatible with the claim that statements about meaning are competing hypotheses. And if they are competing hypotheses, then, then we can use simplicity to narrow them down to one which is true. Second, and more importantly, uh, this objection is question begging. If we accept the sceptic's argument, then perhaps frank means plus and frank means cuss are not competing hypotheses. But the sceptic's argument relies on the premise that nothing can justify choosing plus over cuss. Uh, and Simplicity considerations, given the biological facts, undermine this premise. The, 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 this, this objection then as, assumes that the sceptic's argument works, but the whole point of the appeal to simplicity is that the sceptical argument doesn't work. So uh, that is a straight solution to the sceptical problem. Um,
it's the solution that strikes me as having the most potential. But as I say, there are there's a huge amount of literature on this. Many philosophers have defended different solutions. Um, and that's it for this series, rather short series. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. Goodbye.